Webster 5. There we go. Which I think is just three articles. Thermoclimate proof. This is something, this, this concept first occurred to me 20, oh, yes. Um, will the Webster readings also be citable? For yes. Test? Webster readings are citable. My slides, my, my lecture slides are citable. Uh, in some cases, if you simply say, Professor Webster kept saying this in class, I'll say, yeah, yeah, I did. That's fine. <laughs> That's citable, too. Uh, I've, I've had that in answers. It's like, yes, I did. I said this probably too many times. But yes, the, the Webster readings are very citable. And in fact, there's one set of Webster readings which you're, you're not required to read before the midterm. It's, I think, Webster 7, which are all the pitfalls, which are eminently useful. So I, at the very least, go look at the Webster 7 readings before the midterm and then have those handy when you do the midterm because there will be a lot of cases you can just read down. The, this is what it looks like. Let me show you. Uh, I wrote a book 20 years ago called Pitfalls of Object-Oriented Development. Uh, and I have been threatening to write a book and never have finished it. Oops. That's Video lectures. Oh, come on, come on. Can I hit anything but readings? Okay. Uh, yes. I'm threatening to make this a book. These are these are the Webster seven readings. All of these are, are pretty short. They all follow the same format. They all look like this. Uh, introduction, symptoms, consequences, detection, extraction, prevention. Uh, but if you simply look at the titles here, trust me, there will be there will be uh, midterm questions where you can just call up this page and say, "Oh, look, uh, betting the company on a given technology or methodology." You can go look at it and say, "Yeah, that's it." And you go, Bam, got a citation. <laughs> so, I, again, my intent here is not how much you memorize. Though the more you know and remember this, the faster you get through the midterm. It is to know that these problems exist, are universal, and are documented. Whether that's in the three books you've read, whether it's in Armour, whether it's in my various posts. Uh, because this, this is all based on stuff that I have seen in real life. Okay, back to the thermocline. What's a thermocline? Who can tell me? Oh, come on, you all read the article. Yes? It's like the temperature difference in water depth, where it changes temperature abruptly. Yeah, really. How, how many of you have ever sw swum in a lake? Yes. OK. You know how there's about a foot of warm water, <laughs> and then you stick your foot be below that, and it's suddenly like ice cold? Yeah. That's yeah. a thermocline. It also happens in the ocean, but it's a little more gradual, but it's very real there, too. Uh, and I first thought of this, I was working at Apple doing contract programming. This was back in 19, end of 88, start of 89. Uh, and my observation, uh, this, is, this is during the time that Steve Jobs was gone. He was over at Next. Uh, and uh, over at, he founded Next, he owned Next. Anyway, but... What I observed during my three or four months there is that there was this upper management layer at Apple, and then there were all the workers, and there was this barrier. And basically, stuff drifted down from upper management, but none of the complaints or bad news ever got back up there. Uh, and what I discovered when I started, you know, several years later, started getting into failed projects, I found this was a typical symptom of failed projects. When I'm called into a corporation to review a troubled project, I spend my first week or two simply talking to people, and I always start with people in the trenches. And what I find is that the actual developers working down there, if I say, "What's going? You know, what are the problems here?" They'll say, "Well, it's this, this, and this." And you know, a few will have access to grind, but after I've talked to a dozen of them, I know pretty much exactly what's going on. that's wrong. Then I talked to the middle manager, thought, oh yeah, you know, we got a few problems, but it's fine. And then I talked to the upper manager, said, oh no, the project's on track. <laughs> it's like, well, do you know that you're actually, people in the trenches are saying, this project will never ship on time. <laughs> and they're like, what, what? And, and 
you know, sometimes they believe me and sometimes they, they thank me and pat me on the head and give me a check and send me on their way and then the project fails. <laughs> I had one project I reviewed three times with increasingly, increasingly negative feedback to upper management and they, they ignored me all the time and then a year after the third one, the, uh, the project was canceled and the senior VP was fired. Yeah. So like, I get the feeling that the managers aren't the ones that want you there. Who, uh, who brings you on? Well, usually it's upper management that brings me on because, you know, and often their idea is, well, you know, we want to get this, this project done. What do we need to do to get it done? And then I tell them, well, you know, you've got some fundamental problems here. You have really bad code. You have bad architecture. If you have architecture, you know, at all, you have no QA and so on. They're like, oh, okay, thank you. The door's that way. Uh, because they were hoping that I would say, well, do this, this, and this, and you'll ship in three weeks. Uh, and that, that, is, that is seldom what I end up saying to them. So, the thermocline of truth, as I call it, is, is this barrier that often exists. And the interesting thing that happens is the closer you get to deadline, it starts moving up towards upper management. Because it becomes harder and harder in the middle management area to deny how bad things are. And this is, in my opinion, the source of the syndrome that Brooks talks about. Uh, how often projects slip three weeks before the ship date. That's the point at which the thermocline has now moved all the way up to the surface. <laughs> uh, favorite, my favorite story on it, I got dragged into Y2K remediation at Fannie Mae. Uh, and the uh, Fannie Mae vice president, who was basically given the task, I was working with her on object stuff, and she got the Y2K, and she basically said, misery loves company, Webster, you're doing this with me. Uh, so I, I spent a year and a half doing that. And they were supposed to have all the remediation done, all the, all the fixes done to all the systems that needed remediation for the Y2K problem by the end of 98. And they were like, 14 divisions that had to do this, of separate divisions. And she would meet with them every week, with the top managers of these 14 divisions every week, and they would have a green, yellow, red status as to how they were doing. And all through the second half of 98, she was getting greens, occasional yellows, and so on. First week of December, three weeks, three weeks before they're supposed to be done, she has a meeting, and all of a sudden, all the reports are yellow and red. Uh, and she pretty much suspected that was that was happening anyway. But her comment was great. She looked around, uh, and all these people, a lot of whom who outranked her technically at Fannie Mae, she looked around and said, "Explain to me what you know now that you didn't know a week ago." And that's the core problem. Upper management often actively discourages bad news. There's a management style that's, you know, don't give me problems, give me solutions. Like, well, no, we actually have problems. And we've suggested solutions. You say we can't afford that, or, you know, it has to ship by this date. Uh, <clears throat> so, what you need is honesty and a management, a, a, a company culture that rewards that honesty. You need to break through that thermocline by, you know, engineers being able to contact upper management and say, we have serious problems, these are the problems, and for upper management not to punish that individual with the honest feedback. Or for that matter, any managers along the way. But simply say, what can we do to fix this and what's a realistic estimate for getting this done? There are organizations that do that, and there are organizations that actually successfully ship software more or less on time. But this is, <clears throat> I did a post about the Air Force. The Air Force has some insane number of accounting systems, like 75 accounting systems within the U.S. Air Force. They're not compatible more or less with each other. The Air Force has not been able to close or balance its books for, for years. So they started this project to have a single unified accounting system for the entire Air Force. They spent seven years and a billion dollars and they killed it. 
And one of the reasons they cited was exactly this. That honesty about the state of the project was punished. That upper management within the Air Force did not want to hear the bad news. And they kept basically covering it up and covering it up and covering it up. And they pulled the plug and they wasted a billion dollars. And they're still using the, the old accounting systems, at least last I knew. Okay, anatomy of a runaway IT project. You know that project I reviewed three times? This is the memo I wrote the third time. Uh, let's go, let's, wait, wait, oh, that's because I'm not. What? Well, I can, yeah. Okay, oh, come back here. Uh, I think I need a new mouse. Okay. The names are changed to protect the guilty. Uh, and <clears throat> some of the interesting things here. We had, I was working for a consulting firm, which I will remain a name to protect the guilty, main client. We had, we had several senior programmers in there acting as mentors. And the reason why I had done these three reviews in a row was because they kept coming back to the president of the company I worked for and saying, this project at this client company is just so bad you won't believe it. Uh, and so I'd come in and do a review and make a list of recommendations and a year later the, our consultants would come back and say, no, it's still, it's still bad. Uh, this is the third time. Uh, said the code base is very fragile. A lot of it is bad old code that, that the client, which I call big firm here, didn't have time to rewrite two years ago, but is now five times its original size and is even worse. <coughs> uh, one consultant, one of our consultants, said he took a code listing, picked pages at random, and found problems on every page he selected, such as hard, pervasive hard coding of adjustable parameters. Uh, Use of, there is a constant named 98 that had the value 98. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a minor point, but you know, this is, you know, the build wouldn't, wouldn't build. Uh, it took forever. Uh, they did, had no chief architect. There was a project manager who fancied himself an architect and kept hiring and firing architects. Uh, the schedules made no sense. Uh, quality assurance was of low priority. Uh, and this was a financial corporation. Uh, so they were having problems with guaranteeing. They, they basically never proved that their financial calculation results were correct. This is three years and about $10 million of this project. And they couldn't verify that they were actually doing auditable and correct financial transactions. Uh, they had this, this, this funny thing. They had this management, I'm trying to think of the right word I want to say. It was, it was a commercial management philosophy. They had hired some trainers to come in and train their people. And, and the key words there were that with mood, sincerity, and commitment, we can accomplish everything. And that was their answer. They said, you know, your, your developers are inadequate. Oops. Why is this blinking? Yeah, it just means that much less to those of you who are here to have to look through. They, they thought mood, sincerity, and commitment would make up for bad engineering. It doesn't. As I say, you can have a bunch of aerospace engineers who have a great mood or very sincere and committed. But if their math is wrong and if they're crummy aerospace engineers, your planes will all crash if they ever get off the ground. And the same is true with software. Uh, also a great example from the client crew. So you may, you may find yourselves amused or horrified by reading that. Uh, that's up to you. Do not defer the difficult. I've already talked about this, and this is why, hey, glad you made it. Sorry about the flight. Uh, 
this this is why I, I asked you to talk about what you think your hard problems are in your your uh, architecture and design uh, documents. It's because of the syndrome of, of the illusion of progress. You do do all the low hanging fruit. You've got you know stacks of code. You've got prototyping tools. You've got libraries. It's like you've got engines. It's like bam, bam, bam. Look, we're we're already 80% done. This is going to be no problem. And then, as you try to finish the rest, you start running into the stuff that Armour talks about. It's like, oh well, we need to do this, and we can't quite figure out how to do it, or this is going to be harder than we think, or there are natural barriers to us getting the the 90 frames per second because we're trying to do this, this, and this, and you know, we're going to have to cut this back, we're going to have to simplify this and, and do this. <clears throat> and this is why you get, as we talked about metrics, the 90-90 rule. You know, the first 90% takes 90% of the project, takes 90% of the schedule time. Remaining 10% takes the other 90% of the time. And this is why you see time and again in commercial software, in in-house software, the syndrome of a project that seems to be not that far away from completion, and it's just taking forever to nail it down. My first experience was the full year that Pages was late. Because I can tell you, at the original ship date, there was a tremendous amount of functionality in there. A lot of the stuff just worked. But trying to get that last, in our case, probably the last 20% done, was agonizingly slow. Because each thing we'd go to solve would break something else or make something else not perform adequately. Or we'd say, oh, in order to accomplish this, we actually have to do this, and we have to do this here. But this causes us to change this part of the design, and now we have to rework this so this is fast enough so we can do this and accomplish this. Take the time uh, to identify the hard problems and start tackling those as soon as you can. It's not popular because, you know, whatever environment, if you're doing your own startup, if you're doing, uh, if you're working at, or, you know, for an employer, wherever you're working at, there's going to be all the pressure for great progress. And like I said, there's, there's a, a whole bunch of what you do that's going to be easier. It keeps getting easier because you have richer development environments. You have richer uh, libraries or tools that you can draw upon. You know, you've got AWS out there. It's like, yeah, just spin this up, and we can do this, and we can do this, and we can do this. <clears throat> you need to take time to think through what the actual problems are that are going to be the hardest to solve. And I think that's it for the Webster. Five readings. Okay, we are going to, let's take roll before we, I send you out, in case any of you choose not to come back. <laughs>